Well, let me ask. Let me ask you this. I was thinking uh, uh, yesterday, I guess, mm. and I was thinking, you know, we have this this problem. Paul was very concerned about quote another Jesus and yes. preaching yes. another Jesus other than the one he had preached. Mm. And uh, so, but is it not then possible that as we've gone into post biblical Christianity, post biblical mm. Theology, and I, I, after the Bible was written, after Paul was dead, who said those words, yeah. and now we're we're trucking into the centuries immediately after that. In reality, they did begin preaching another Jesus. It's not us who are preaching another Jesus. Somebody else already beat us to that. <laughs> Back through the centuries, mm. you had folks who began preaching a Jesus who was not the Jesus who said in in Mark 12 that the greatest of all the commandments is. Mm. A hero Israel, the Lord our God is one. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, we're not going to have that. We're going to have hero Israel, the Lord our God is three. Now, where in the world did this come from? What they've done is to impose a different Jesus on the original Jesus. They mm -hmm. superimposed a new and different Jesus on the original one. If you peel off the sticker, you discover the original underneath. You can have two John Smiths, <laughs> but they are separate. That you can identify them by tracing their origin. If you find that one was born you know, at a certain time and another was a different time then you know they're not the same person. Could we say yes. that if, if Jesus were to come today here mm. and we were to introduce him to the Jesus of theology and our making, <laughs> would he know himself? Would he recognize himself? Ah. Now that's another Jesus. Yes. <laughs> yes, to the Jesus of theology. <laughs> would, he, would he know himself, right? Yeah. Would he recognize himself? Yeah. Yes, yes. The other thing is we could say that Christianity is the only religion that begins by discarding its own founder's creed. Oh, yeah. There's an amazing quotation in one of the standard uh, commentaries, the word Bible commentary, word biblical commentary, mm. which is state of the art in evangelical theology. And when you get to Mark 12, you know, when Jesus recites what he calls the greatest commandment of all, mm. listen Israel, don't miss this one, the Lord our God is one Lord, as it reads in the Greek. Mm. And the commentator says, it's so rather amazing that Mark would bother to record this because this is not specifically Christian. <laughs> and you're smiling. <laughs> but this is taken in all seriousness. Oh, in other words, what Jesus said is not specifically Christian. What Christ said is really nothing to do with Christianity. Doesn't that give the whole game away? Mm -hmm. how, how can you possibly say that the creed that Jesus said is the one thing you mustn't miss is not essentially Christian? Okay. That's astonishing to me. I don't think the public has fully taken this in yet. I want, right. I want us to think about that, go oh home meditating God. on that. <laughs> if that isn't That's Christian, right. then what is Christian? Oh isn't mind. the teaching of Jesus Christian, or is it? You know, this is what we've got to decide. So I guess we decide that later folks, post-biblical folks, were more Christian than Christ. Absolutely. <laughs> I don't understand this at all. It makes no <laughs> sense at all. That creed has got to be important. Isn't the creed what defines God for you? you know, this is the whole operation of religion. And it is a religion. Religion oh, okay. only means linking yourself with God. We're all trying to do that. Mm -hmm. We might do Jesus the honor, it seems to me, of getting his definition of God straight out of Scripture. <laughs> Why not? Isn't that a good who, beginning? Who we're trying to link to. It would yes. be helpful. <laughs> right. If Jesus felt that was the most important thing, and then the scribe, who is a Jew himself, says, you got it right. Well, Jesus yes, and uh, the scribe agree. Clearly it's a Jewish creed. And we know that the Jewish creed was always Unitarian, mm, mm. never a Trinitarian creed, mm, mm, simply mm. because Jesus said that God is one Lord, a single Lord, not two Lords, not three Lords. Mm. Jesus was not a Trinitarian. Every historian knows mm. that. Mm -hmm. Why then don't we read the Bible intelligently in the light of its Hebrew first century context? That's yeah. our point. So we've got then one Jesus superimposed on another. You might say that philosopher theologians have superimposed on the original Jesus. Mm, mm. Another Jesus who is very strange and philosophical. Ah, yes. We've got Nicaea 3.25 in place of Mark 12.29. Now that's very <laughs> serious. Yes. We're in danger of obscuring the very Jesus that we want to relate to. Mm. And so if you peel off the sticker of the second Jesus, peel off the sticker underneath you'll find a very much clearer and easier Jesus. That Jesus was really a human mm. being. That was Mary had a baby. She conceived and had a baby. Mary did not take in from outside a pre-existing billions of years old or eternal being. Mm. That's a totally different story. Mm. In other words, if you have two John Smiths, how do you tell if they're the same person or if they're two different persons? You check the origin. 
Mm. The date of birth is unlikely to be the same. So you look at the origin to find out who somebody really is. And the origin of Jesus is written right there in, in Matthew 1, 18. Genesis of Jesus, the very word Genesis in the Greek. Genesis, as the Greeks would say today. The origin is very clear. Mary had a baby supernaturally. Mm. That's easy. It gets the Jews interested in what we're doing because they believe that God is one. Now we have a basis for sensible dialogue. Mm. But mm. we don't, as long as this Trinitarian thing, this odd three in one, which is so inexplicable, as long as that's there, we're in great difficulty making headway with the simplicity of the faith. Mm. Mm. So, and how much easier is this if you present a Jesus that's comprehensible <laughs> yeah. or a God that's comprehensible? If we come along and say, now you've got to believe in this three in one, now we're not able to explain this, they'll say, you've got to somehow apprehend it without comprehending it. Mm. <laughs> you've got to be able to say, as Melod Erickson, who is the spokesman for Trinitarian Orthodoxy, in his book on the Triune God, he says, you have to be able to say, God are three. <laughs> Uh, and you've got to be able to say, he are three. I can barely compose this sentence in my <laughs> mind, it's so difficult. You've got to be able to say, they is three. <laughs> yes. And he are one. <laughs> in order to be a good Trinitarian. And I'm saying, surely this cannot be right. Mm -hmm. Don't tell me that Mrs. X, you know, struggling for a relationship with God, has to be able to butcher her own sense of language and convolute language to that extent in order to express this inexpressible Trinitarian thing. It has mystery and falsehood written all oh over it, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Especially because Jesus was a Jew and showed no signs at all of ever deviating from the greatest of all truths of his heritage. And you know, the rabbis taught the children to say, Shema Yisrael, God is Echad, he's one. They taught the children to say that as soon as they could speak, or to hold up one finger and say, this is one. <laughs> this is a very easy concept, it's very simple, and it could quickly unite a lot of people who are searching and seeking for God in a desperately difficult world mm -hmm. uh, under one banner. Mm -hmm. At least we can agree that God is Echad, one. Not one in three, but a single. Mm -hmm. And that's of course what Echad means. Mm -hmm. It means a single. It doesn't mean one complex, plural, something or other. Yeah. That's just impossible. You, you don't just, you, it doesn't make sense to say Echad and hold up three fingers. <laughs> it makes no sense at all. <laughs> And yet, that seems to be what they're doing. That's right. they, 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 well, they yeah. talk about complex unity, but they've forgotten that the pronoun I, and me, and thee, and thou, and he, and him, there are 14 forms of the personal pronoun in the singular. We all know that indicates, under normal circumstances, there might be some rare exceptions, but that means a single person. And God goes around saying, I am he, there's no one else beside me, it's me, only me. Jesus, of course, quotes... Uh, the Unitarian idea so well in John 17, 3, that they may come to know you, Father, who are the only one who is truly God. Mm -hmm. O monos, alithinos theos, I'm using the modern Greek pronunciation there for our Greek-speaking uh, audience. The only one who is truly God, and we have to recognize Jesus Christ as Messiah, but the only one who is truly God is defined there as the Father. Paul then likewise in 1 Corinthians 8 says to us Christians, however many pagan gods there may be in the pagan world, to us Christians, there's only one God come of the Father. Mm -hmm. And of course there's one Lord Jesus Messiah as well. Yes, that's right, but he's the Lord Messiah, notice. He's the Lord Jesus Messiah, not the Lord God. <laughs> so there's no text in the Bible which ever says there is one God, comma, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. <laughs> if there were, we'd all become Trinitarian. Yeah. Nowhere does Scripture say that. It does say there's one God, but it always says, one God, come at the Father. In addition to that, we're recognizing the Lord Messiah. Well, that's very easy because Luke, the beloved historian Luke, laid this out so beautifully for us in Luke 2, 11, where he says, Today, uh, the announcement to the shepherds, Today is born for you one who is the Lord Messiah, the Lord Christ, not the Lord God. God doesn't get born. I think there's an atheist who says, Well, to be a Christian, you have to believe that God got himself born. No, no, no. We don't believe that. The Lord Messiah was born to Mary. And then down there in 2.26 of Luke, just a few verses later, Luke 2.26, he's the Lord's Messiah. That's to say, Yahweh's Messiah, of course. But he himself is the Lord Messiah, not the Lord's Messiah. <laughs> so to suggest that the Lord Messiah is all equally God, or is also God, is really so complicated and so difficult. <laughs> and worse than that, Dan, as we know, they killed each other over these issues. Oh, my land, yes. This is an awful it's thing. It's a terrible heritage to It's have, a isn't terrible it? heritage. When you think of 
Calvin, John Calvin, the former, murdering Servetus, burning him at the stake on this issue. This is a tragedy that has to be wiped out from our past, you know, repented of, uh, and so that we resolve never ever to kill or burn or malign people on issues of doctrinal uh, truth. That's just impossible. Wow. However, by 150 AD, Justin Martyr is saying, when the Holy Spirit came over Mary to effect this extraordinary miracle that God was performing, that really was Jesus, the pre-existing Son of God, engineering his own conception. <laughs> now that really is bizarre. Yeah. Nobody reading that matchless account in Luke 135, that's the place that anybody investigating this subject should start, Luke 132 to 35. In a few succinct words there, Gabriel explains to Mary how it is that this child of hers is going to be the Son of God. And Gabriel says in a very few words there, precisely because of the miracle. That's why he's the Son of God. End of argument. Now you carry that Son of God concept into the New Testament and all is plain. He's the mm. Son of God because God is his father. Guess what? Isn't that easy? God is his father. Joseph is his legal father, but not his, his biological father. So and that's very the, And this is Justin Martyr who... Uh, Justin Martyr. Up, about, you say, around 150... Around 150 ish. AD, yeah. you can see the language of the church has changed. Mm. And when we see a change of language, we're suspicious of another Jesus. Mm. Mm. Producer. Mm. Your point about, you know, if Jesus were to come back today and you introduce him to the Greek philosophical Jesus that emerged yeah. with these strange concepts in the second century onwards, Jesus might well say, is this really me? Yeah. Who is this? Who is this? <laughs> Who is I don't recognize this uh, member, you know, a member of the triune Godhead <laughs> who's supposed to be God the Son. We've made a switch from Son of God to God the Son. The question is, have we now got a, a, a grand case of mistaken identity? Wow. And that is serious because the great question in the New Testament is always, who do you say that I, Jesus, am, right? Mm -hmm. Let's get this clear, Peter. Peter is asked this question by the mentor, by the rabbi Jesus. And Peter says, you're, you're the Messiah, you're the Son of God. I say, the Son of God, the Messiah, that's clear. And Jesus' reaction to that is ecstatic. He's happy. You got this <laughs> through the Spirit of God. This that's is inspired right. stuff, Peter. Now, on that rock, we can build my church. Yes, yes. But it's questionable whether he's building his church on God the Son yeah. of the triune Trinitarian idea. Is, as you said, a post-biblical concept. Well, it was so interesting to me. You take a passage like uh, Matthew sixteen sixteen, mm. and there, uh, and we interpose on the words of the scripture what we have in post biblical terms thought. Yes. And in reality, what you know, when Jesus said, "Who do you say that I am?" Mm. Peter didn't say, "Well, obviously you're God." <laughs> you know? He said, "No, no, you you are." Uh, the Messiah yes. that we have anticipated and been waiting on. Yes. You are indeed the Christ. You are God's Son. Uh, that's what the Scripture says. Why can't we be happy with that? That's right. Why can't that make us happy? It made Jesus happy. That's very easy. Why can't it just make us happy? Right. Yeah, I don't uh, and he was thinking clearly of Psalm 2 7. Mm -hmm. This day I have begotten you. I mean, this se second Psalm is a great key to this whole subject mm -hmm. we're discussing. Psalm 2 7 there, this day I become your father. The word begets foggy for us, you know, in, in our day, but to beget means to bring into existence, to sire, to father, to engender, to give existence to. Mm -hmm. So the whole idea of having existence before you exist is really <laughs> incomprehensible. Let's just talk briefly about this word pre exist. Uh, pre existing conditions, that belongs in the world of medicine. Mm. I can understand that you can have a pre-existing disease. <laughs> you can go to a doctor, and you've already had this disease, or insurance company, uh, you've already had the disease. That I can understand. But to say that the Son of God pre-exists is really fog language. Mm. It's a cover for the invention of another Jesus, a pre-human Jesus, mm. as one group calls him. You cannot be pre-human and be human. <laughs> it's simply impossible. If you're pre-human, then you're an angel, Mm. perhaps Michael the Archangel, or you're the eternally begotten Son of God, God the Son, but you're not human. Mm. You can pretend to be human, you can dress up as human, you can put on the mask of humanity, but you cannot be something other than non-human mm. if you're pre-human. <laughs> and if you simply read Matthew and Luke, nothing of that complexity is there. Mm. So in Matthew 1.18 you have, now this is the genesis of Jesus. There's a nice little trick there, Dan, in, in the Greek, 
uh, the Greek word for Genesis is to, spelled with one N there, Genesis. And some of the scribes later on, when they were copied, copying the manuscript, said, well, you know, this is a bit awkward because it doesn't sound like the later Jesus who didn't have a beginning in the world. <laughs> yeah. So, supposing we call this birth rather than Genesis, it takes the edge off the point slightly. Yes, it's his birth, but it's not really his Genesis. So all they had to do was to add an N and put two N's in that word Genesis. And it gave the sense of birth rather than origin. Now the word Genesis with one end there, Genesis, occurs also in Matthew 1.1. 1, 1. So the very opening, grand opening statement of the whole New Testament mm. is this, this is about Jesus Christ, the son of uh, Abraham, the son of David, and it's the Genesis of Jesus, mm. the family history. Well, can you imagine telling the family history of Jesus without mentioning all of that pre-human stuff, right. with, of which there's not a single word in Matthew and mm. Luke? Mm. So, of course, then the obvious question arises, how did they get to this pre-human Jesus? Well, they had to superimpose that one on the matchlessly simple accounts of Matthew and Luke, and they did it via the Gospel of John, right? Mm. And that's a different subject slightly. Right. But by abusing the, by gospel. Abusing the, uh, the yeah. gospel of John, That's to right. make it fit with their preconceived idea of what Matthew and Luke ought to say. Yeah. It's what Matthew and Luke should have said. That's yeah. what they really should they have said. They just didn't get it in there, they but they should have said that's that. That's right. <laughs> so that's the fascinating challenge, and this is a most interesting exercise for Bible students everywhere, of all faiths, who have access mm -hmm. to a Bible, is to read Matthew and Luke carefully, mm. and of course to pray that God would guide us in the truth and, and correct us if necessary, mm and see well, what really is being presented as the true Jesus here in Matthew and Luke. When you've got that firmly established, then you can move to the uh, second level instruction, which is John. But don't start with John. John knew Matthew, Mark, and Luke. He said, yeah, that's clear. All of that I agree with. Now let me give you a different portrait of Jesus. Not a different Jesus, but Jesus from a different angle. But he didn't intend in any way to contradict what Matthew and Luke had already written. Mm. And of course, Paul didn't either. Yeah. Paul was the traveling companion of Luke. They didn't disagree over who Jesus was. <laughs> so it's absurd to take Paul, and you know there's a warning in, in the Bible that he is difficult sometimes. Mm. He's rather complex. Peter says, our beloved brother Paul, but some of his stuff is difficult. To read. You don't begin there. Yeah. So what do people do? Well, they begin with Paul. <laughs> yeah. And they begin with John. You see, It's exactly the backwards method. It isn't the method that the Bible itself well, recommends. I, 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 what I find difficult about that for people is that they do this by excising from Paul or from John yes. and the Gospel of John, mm. excising mm. what they want to do, take it out of its really larger context, right. and then making something of it. It really isn't. Right. Never was. Never was to Jesus. Never was to Matthew. Never yeah. was to to Luke. Never was to John mm -hmm. or Paul. Mm -hmm. They did not believe in a different Jesus than the one who stood and said, "The greatest of all commandments is to realize that." God is one. There's only one. Now we have evolved from that, mm -hmm. if you will, as Christianity, and we're going far and wide proclaiming God is three. Yes. And if you don't believe it, we may, you know, we may torture you or beat you up, or so, if we can't do that anymore, at least we will uh, chuck rocks at you, one, yes. you know, one form or another. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll do some sort of a character assassination. We can't do the other anymore, so the uh, the civil authorities won't let us do it anymore. That's right, so. and we're very grateful for that. Oh, yes, we're enjoying indeed. such a degree of freedom, and the very fact that we're sitting here, you know, making a little film together it, it is a tremendous token, I think, of the freedom mm. that we're enjoying, partly because people saw that the murder of heretics, mm. mm -hmm. <laughs> so-called heretics, yeah, right. was a scandal that's and ought never to happen yeah. again. You know that five of the presidents of the USA were Unitarian people. They wow. don't believe in the Trinity. That's tremendous. No, I don't, people don't know that. They don't know that. <laughs> they, they went a little bit too far because there's always the danger that non-Trinitarians will become very rationalist and do away with the Virgin sure. birth and the miracle. We don't want to do that. Absolutely. We believe in the miracles. We yeah. believe in the second coming. Certainly the virginal uh, begetting of Jesus is essential. Sure. It's, yeah. the it's all scripture. It's, it's just scripture. scripture. Yeah. Well, I think, uh, to me, it's. Uh, I'm, I'm working on a, a piece that Maybe I'll, I'll have finished next time we get together. But I've been working on a piece from my own experience that says how John convinced me mm. that God is one. <laughs> yes. And I, I think people overlook that. They go into it with their Trinitarian glasses on and say, oh, I mean, a John, and this means that, and that means this. Yes. And, but when you take John for what he's really saying, for what he really believed, put him in his context, mm. let his larger context speak to you, yeah. no one ever believed that God is one more than John. No, and that's, I, exactly. that's a wonderful, wonderful uh, lesson. In that's that. right. In yeah. particular, that verse in John 17, 3, where in the great Lord's Prayer, oh, my and goodness. he declares... This is eternal life. That's a very strong statement. Mm -hmm. This is 
how we achieve mm. immortality. In yeah, fact. yeah. If you want to know what real religion is, this is it, Jesus says. That they would believe in you, Father, as the single one who is truly God, true God, wow. the only one who is truly God. And, of course, believe in Jesus as Messiah is essential, right. but he's clearly excluded from the category one God there. Wow. If language has any meaning at all, he's excluded, because only, as we all know in English, limits and excludes. When we say only, we use it all the time, we have no difficulty at all understanding. And nobody should, un should misunderstand that classic statement in John 17, 3, that you, Father, he defines him as a Father, he's talking to the Father, are the only single one who is absolutely and truly God. Well, there you are. And, and don't you think that's a terrible problem text? a difficult text. Yeah. For anybody who thinks God is multiple beings, entities, persons, mm -hmm. personalities, whatever, mm -hmm. don't you think John 17 and 3 is just a terribly difficult text it's, it's for them to deal with in that? And most of the time, I find that they prefer to go other texts and not really dwell on that. Let's, let's move on to something else. Well, <laughs> We don't like to talk about John 17 right. and 3 that much. So uh, We have the help there of um, uh, my cousin J.T. Robinson at Cambridge, the late John Robinson, fairly well known a theologian there in Europe, and not that we would agree with everything he wrote by any means, but he did say there that John is as undeviating a witness to the unitary monotheism as are all New Testament writers. <laughs> An undeviating witness. No. John's Jesus, he said in his scholarly way. John's Jesus <laughs> is as undeviating a witness to the unitary monotheism which is shared by every New Testament writer. Then there was another uh, Dean Matthews, who used to write in the Daily Telegraph in London for years when I was a kid, and he said, anybody with a modicum, even a small amount of historical knowledge, knows that the Trinity had never been imagined in the day wow. of Jesus. They weren't talking that language at all. Wow. It's a later development in, in uh, terms of Greek philosophy. Mm, mm. And one other scholar said, made this remark, he said that when Christianity became a theology in the worst sense, not that theology is bad, but a bad theology, this was the fall of Christianity. When it mixed itself with Greek philosophy, this was the fall, like in Genesis, the fall of man. It was the fall of Christianity. And we make the point by saying that this is the only religion that discards the very creedal statement of Jesus itself. Oh my goodness, itself. Yeah. It's amazing. It is true. Why it's don't we do it in church? Unbelievable, but, uh, it's, but it's true. Why don't we it's recite different. in church every Sunday? Let's all recite the creed. Excellent. We don't yes. need a complicated creed. Listen, Israel. The Lord our God is a single one Lord. <laughs> and of course we believe in the Lord Messiah who died for our sins, who preached the gospel of the kingdom and is coming back to set up the kingdom on the earth to establish peace on a very tormented and tortured earth wow. as it is now. And uh, You know, I was thinking the other day and I've uh, done some work recently on this creed business, but mm. I was thinking, why don't we say that creed? Uh, why don't we do the Deuteronomy 6 and 4 yes. thing, why don't we, and, and, but it occurred to me, it would be far too confusing for Trinitarian or three-person God folks <laughs> who are uh, thriving on, they, they suppose, on post-biblical theology. Yes. If you've got people saying, you know, the Lord our God is one, yes. Uh, or he alone is God, mm -hmm. that would be very confusing, wouldn't it? <laughs> I'm it being, would. And I'm to, being facetious, you know, I suppose. Well, to children particularly, because yeah, in yeah. the Greek, you know, the Greek version of the Shema certainly has the Lord our God is one Lord. <laughs> one Lord. Well, one Lord doesn't suggest two Lords. <laughs> yes. And so you're stuck with this impossible argument of trying to turn one into three. I came across an article the other day in which uh, a large group represented by numbers of PhDs had written this. One plus one plus one equals one. <laughs> they called that the keystone of biblical theology. Well, what is the char going to make of that? One plus one plus one is one. That's what you're stuck with. One will not be three. And no kind of prodigious effort to make, make the word the Hebrew word echad, the Greek word is, meaning one, to make it more than one is simply impossible. So the arguments out there on the internet are particularly disappointing, actually. <laughs> you're being told that echad is really plural. Here's the argument. One bunch of grapes, you see. <laughs> yes. So there are many grapes in that bunch. So one really means many. Mm -hmm. No, no, there's still one bunch and not two bunches. So Adam and Eve were one flesh. Yes, but they weren't two fleshes. <laughs> one always, I want to tell our audience, means echad. Check with the rabbi, look it up in the Hebrew lexicon. One means one single. It sometimes substitutes for the indefinite article A. 
A bunch of grapes, one bunch of grapes, only one. Abraham was only one person, we read in Ezekiel 33, I think. Abraham was echad, one single person. Was he plural? Well, he may have had arms and legs, so he was... No, no that's absurd. We, we've, we've really lowered ourselves as a human race into absurdity to defend what is indefensible in terms of the most simple concepts. And children are really puzzled by this notion that one is really three. I, I have to say, and of course, uh, this this word, the Hebrew word "kav," mm. becomes of interest because it's such a devastating word to any idea that God is multiple beings, multiple persons, multiple personality, any kind of multiple anything. Yes. This word ikad says only, one, yes. one only, yes. single. Absolutely. And and so it's amazing to me, and uh, this shows how little that our Bible students today uh, bother to check out things. Yeah. But it's amazing to me that we have apologists for the three-person God <laughs> view who are going around saying, oh, one doesn't really mean one. Uh, Ikad yeah. is multiple. This is, this is just on my land. It's I can always great. picture this. Yeah. I, I was thinking the other day, I, I can just picture one of these apologists transported mm. back into Old Testament times, sitting down with the children mm. in Israel, and they're all reciting, as, as Moses had encouraged them to do, you know, uh, here, O Israel, you know, the Lord our God is Ikad. He mm. is one. Mm. There's none but him. And I can just picture the apologist sitting down with them and saying, yes, God is one, mm. and always has been one, and he'll always be one. I, I think it would be terribly, you know, the children in Israel could teach our modern-day apologists yes. something. The apologists today have been just hit with a, well, we, we say in Tennessee, a dumb stick. <laughs> but, but how can you turn three into one, one into three, and then call it sensible? It's not sensible, it's not scriptural, it's not spiritual, it's not anything. It's just mass confusion that got started in post-biblical times following the real Jesus, the yes. true Jesus, yes. the one who we were saying earlier, if he met the Jesus of theology today, yes. he might say, who's that? Exactly. Where did this guy come from? <laughs> You're saying that's me, it's not yes. me. There's a nice point there in First John 4. You know, John says when you're examining other folks' lives and their belief system, the issue is not are they good chaps. Mm. Not firstly, are they good chaps. It's important to be honest and straightforward and so on. But that's not the real test. You want to test to see what they're saying about Jesus. Mm. Has their mind been affected mm. by the mm. Bible or some other sort? Mm. So mm. test the spirits, meaning test what these people say. How are they defining Jesus? And the test that John gives, the sort of litmus test, the, the gold standard, if you like, is simply this, that you're to see whether they're prepared to admit to confessing the Jesus who came in the flesh. Mm. It's the having come in the flesh Jesus, a little awkward in English, but Jesus as the one who was essentially human and historical. Mm. Mm. To be in the flesh, to come in the flesh means you're a human being. So he who confesses Jesus as the one who came, Jesus Christ, I should say, Jesus Christ, Jesus Messiah, as the one who came as fully human, that's the right idea. Now, he who does not confess that Jesus, mm, the mm, next verse, mm, mm. is to be avoided. Mm. So, if somebody confesses that Jesus who is not the fully human historical Jesus, then you need to be careful. Mm, mm. There's an interesting point in the Greek grammar there, in verse 3, he who does not confess Jesus, our translations say, well, that's vague. I mean, it's not a, just a question of confessing Jesus. Mm. It's a question of not confessing that particular Jesus mm -hmm. that I just described in verse 2. Well, that's right. And that's exactly then Paul's idea of another Jesus. And notice also that in 2 Corinthians 11 there, the Corinthians had to be woken up. Mm. They were believers. Mm. But Paul says, if somebody comes and preaches you another Jesus, or another gospel, or another spirit, you're putting up with it. You're saying, great, you know, go for it. <laughs> that's right. It took an apostle actually to walk in there. Now, we don't have apostles like the twelve today. We do not. Uh, you have to have seen Jesus, you know, personally shaken hands with him. And you've got to whole, have all these accrediting signs, which evidently people don't have today in the same way. But we're trying to learn from our mentors, the apostles. And so Paul is very keen then to guard the congregation against in the invasion mm. of some specious Jesus that mm. isn't really that human, historical Messiah, Son of God because of the virginal beginning. And that has certainly happened. And that's the disaster that's hit the faith. I'm don't afraid. you think uh, that Paul... Uh, as an apostle and in spirit, could sense these very kinds of things coming, and John as oh, well. Oh, sure he did. You know, uh, who would have thought that 
later on there would be post-biblical Christians trying to use Paul's words and John's words oh, yes. to do the very thing that they were cautioning oh, yes. against. Absolutely. Preaching a non, yes. not truly a human Jesus. Oh, yes. we'll, we'll, uh, we'll make him a, a God and a man yes. sort of thing, whatever that's supposed to yes. be, though the Bible never says that. 100% once. God, 100% man. Yeah, 100%. Oh yes, that's interesting. So, how, how does that work? Because if the 100% God part couldn't die, <laughs> then did the hundred percent man part did die? This is very strange. I mean, tell that to a child. He's a hundred percent holy God and a hundred percent man. Now wait a minute. The God part cannot die. So the hundred percent didn't die, but the hundred percent did die. Explain that to the children. You see, this is the trouble with theology. What the clergy, I think, did in those early centuries was to embrace this mysterious material and then ask people to pay them to explain it because yeah. you know you poor people don't understand yeah. this. But we'll explain this mystery right. to you. It's not that kind of a mystery in scripture at all. Now the, we must hasten to add, there are many things we don't know about God, all Surely. of them. There's a vast amount about God that is not revealed in scripture. But I don't think who he is in terms of numbers, <laughs> the numerics of God being one rather than three, that's not a mystery. That's pretty revealed, don't that's you? That's very clear. <laughs> it's pretty straightforward. We weren't meant yeah. to struggle with that, but we're struggling at the most elementary level here. We haven't even got past that one. <laughs> if we get to the one God and the Messiah Jesus, then we can begin to build the rest of the faith. Yeah more successfully. I thought it was interesting on this, uh, on your talk about him being 100% man mm. and 100% God, whatever that would mean, the mm. Bible never said things like that, it's post-biblical mm. language, but, uh, but I remember, uh, and talking about the children, I remember talking to a, uh, a young fellow, might have been in his early teens, mm -hmm. but, and we were talking about the 100% man and the 100% God thing, he said, well then, Jesus would equal 200%. Yeah. He said, that doesn't That's make right. sense. It doesn't make <laughs> sense. No, I'll explain it at least. I mean, make that clear to the, the simple mass <laughs> student. I mean, it doesn't make any sense.